We now come to the statement. I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin my statement, my thoughts and prayers are with those affected by the events in Southport, and I am sure that the whole House will join me in paying tribute to our emergency services who are dealing with this ongoing situation. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, on my first day as Chancellor of the Exchequer, I asked Treasury officials to assess the state of public spending. That work is now complete, and I am today presenting it to this House. In this statement, I will do three things. First, I will expose the scale and the seriousness of what has been uncovered. Second, I will lay out the immediate action that we are taking to deal with the inheritance. And third, I will set out our longer-term plans to fix the foundations of our economy. Yeah. Let me take each of these in turn. First, the inheritance. Before the election, I said that we would face the worst inheritance since the Second World War. Taxes at a 70-year high, debt through the roof, an economy only just coming out of recession. Mr Speaker, I knew all of these things. I was honest about them during the campaign. And the difficult choices that it meant. And the British people knew them too. That is why they voted for change. Yeah. But upon my arrival at the Treasury three weeks ago, it became clear that there were things that I did not know. Yeah. Things that the party opposite, things that the party opposite. Order, order, order. This is an important statement for your constituents. And my... Sorry. Is it? It's important to my constituents here as well. If I'm struggling to hear it, they're struggling at home as well. So please, you'll all get your chance to question. I think it's more important to hear and then comment. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Things that the party opposite covered up. Covered up from the opposition, covered up from this house, covered up from the country. That is why we're today publishing a detailed audit of the real spending situation, a copy of which will be laid in the House of Commons Library. I want to take this opportunity to thank my right honourable friend, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, for his leadership, yeah. and to Treasury officials, and to Treasury officials for all their work in producing this document. Now let me explain what it has uncovered. Mr. Speaker, the government published its plans for day-to-day -day spending in the spring budget in March. But when I arrived at the Treasury on the very first day, I was alerted by officials that this was not how much the previous government expected to spend this year. Ah. It wasn't even close. In fact, the total pressures on these budgets across a range of areas was an additional £35 billion. Pounds. <laughs> Once you account for the slippage in budgets you usually see over a year and the reserve of £9 billion pounds designed to respond to genuinely unexpected events, it means, Mr Speaker, that we have inherited a projected overspend of £22 billion. Pounds. <laughs> a £22 billion pound hole in the public finances now. Yeah. Not in the future, but now. £22 billion pounds of spending this year that was covered up by the party opposite. Yeah. Yeah. If left unaddressed, it would mean a 25% increase in the budget deficit this year. So I will today set out the necessary and urgent work that I have already done to reduce that pressure on the public finances by £5.5 billion pounds this year and over £8 billion pounds next year. Let me be clear, I'm not talking about costs for future years that they signed up to but did not include, like the compensation for infected blood, which has cross-party support. I'm not talking about the state of public services in the future, like the crisis in our prisons, which they have left for us to fix. I'm talking about the money that they were already spending this year and had no ability to pay for, which they hid from the country. They had exhausted the reserve and they knew that, but nobody else did. Yep. Yeah, um, Yet they ducked the difficult decisions. They put party before country. Yeah. Yeah. And they continued. Yeah, yeah. And they continued to make unfunded commitment after unfunded commitment, knowing that the money was not there. Yeah. Resulting in the position that we have now inherited. The Reserve spent more than three times over, only three months into the financial year. And they told no one. Mr Speaker, the scale of this overspend is not sustainable. Not to act is simply not an option. We've already seen official ONS figures this month showing that borrowing is higher this year than the OBR expected. 
and the disaster of Liz Truss's mini-budget shows what happens if you don't take tough decisions to maintain economic stability. Some, including the leader of the, of the opposition and the shadow chancellor, have claimed the books were open. How dare they? Yeah. It is not yeah. true. Yeah. And let me tell you why. There are very clear instances of specific budgets that were overspent and unfunded promises that were made, but that crucially, the OBR was not aware of for their March forecast. I will now take each of these in turn. First, the asylum system. The forecast for the number of asylum seekers has risen dramatically since the last spending review, and costs for asylum support have risen sevenfold in the past three years. Sevenfold. But instead of reflecting these costs in the Home Office budget for this year, mm. the previous government covered up the true extent of this crisis and its spending implications. The document I am publishing today reveals a projected overspend on the asylum system, including their failed Rwanda plan for this year alone, of more than £6.4 billion. Pounds. That was unfunded and it was undisclosed. Next, in the wake of the pandemic, demand for rail services fell. But instead of developing a proper plan to adjust for this new reality, the government handed out cash to rail companies to make up for passenger shortfalls, but failed to budget for this adequately. Because of that, and because of industrial action, there is now an overspend of £1.6 billion in the transport budget. That was unfunded, and it was undisclosed. Mr Speaker, since 2022, the government, with the support of this whole House, has rightly provided military assistance to Ukraine in response to the Russian invasion. The spending audit has found that there was not enough money set aside for the reserve to fund all these costs. We will continue to honour these commitments in full. And unlike the previous government, we will make sure that they are always fully funded. Yeah. On top of these new pressures, since 2021, inflation was above the Bank of England's target for 33 months in a row, hitting 11% at its peak. But the previous government had not held a spending review since 2021. Mm -hmm. That means they never fully reflected the impact of inflation in departmental budgets. This has had a direct impact on budgets for public sector pay. Yeah. When the last spending review was conducted, it was assumed that pay awards would be 2% this year. Uh -oh. Ordinarily, the government is expected to give evidence to the pay review bodies on affordability. Mm. But extraordinarily, this year, the previous government provided no guidance on what could or could not be afforded to the pay review bodies. This is almost unheard of, but that is exactly what they did. Worse still, the former Education Secretary had the pay re review body recommendations sitting on her desk. But instead of responding and dealing with the consequences, they shirked the decisions that needed to be taken. I will not repeat their mistakes. Where the previous government provided no transparency to the public and no certainty for public services, we will be open about the decisions which are needed and the steps that we are taking. That begins with accepting in full the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies and the details of these awards are being published today. Yeah. That is the right decision for the people who work in and most importantly the people who use our public services. Yeah. Giving hard-working staff the pay rises they deserve while ensuring that we can recruit and retain the people we need. It should not have taken this long to come to these decisions yeah. and I do not want to be in this position again. So I will consider options to reform the timetable for responding to the pay review bodies in the future. This decision is in the best interests of our economy too. The last government presided over the worst set of strikes in a generation. This caused chaos and misery for the British public, and it wreaked havoc on the public finances. Industrial action in the NHS alone cost the taxpayer £1.7 billion last year. That is why I am pleased to announce today that the government has agreed an offer to the junior doctors, which the BMA are recommending to their members. My right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, will set out further details. Let me pay tribute to him. His leadership on this issue has paved the way to ending a dispute which has caused waiting lists to spiral, operations to be delayed, and agony for patients to be prolonged. Today marks the start of a new relationship 
between the government and staff working in our National Health Service. And the whole country, the whole country will welcome that. Mr Speaker, where the previous government ducked the difficult decisions, I am taking action. Because knowing what they did about the state of the public finances, they continued to make unfunded commitment after unfunded commitment that they knew they could not afford. Putting party before country, leaving us with an overspend of £22 billion this year. Where they presided over recklessness, I will bring responsibility. I will take immediate action. Let me sit this out in detail. First on pay. I have today set out our decision to meet the recommendation of the pay review bodies. Because the previous government failed to prepare for these recommendations in their departmental budgets, they come at an additional cost of £9 billion this year. So the first difficult choice I am making is to ask all departments to find savings to absorb as much of this as possible, totalling at least £3 billion. To support departments as they do this, I will work with them to find savings ahead of the autumn budget, including through measures to stop all non-essential spending on consultancy and government communications. And I am taking action to ask departments to find 2% savings in their back office costs. Mr Speaker, I will now deal with a series of commitments made by the previous government, which they did not fund. Because if we cannot afford it, we cannot do it. Yeah. First, at Conservative Party conference last year, the former Prime Minister announced the introduction of a new qualification, the Advanced British Standard. Yeah. That is a commitment costing nearly £200 million next year, rising to billions across future years. Mr Speaker, this was supposed to be the former Prime Minister's legacy. But it turns out he didn't put aside a single penny to pay for it. So we will not go ahead with that policy because if we cannot afford it, we cannot do it. Next year, the Illegal Migration Act passed by the previous government made it impossible to process asylum applications or remove people who have no right to be here. Instead, they relied on a doomed policy to send asylum seekers to Rwanda on planes that never took off leaving tens of thousands of people stuck in hotels on the public purse. We need a properly controlled and managed asylum system where rules are enforced so that those with no right to be here are swiftly removed. So we have scrapped their failed Rwanda scheme, which placed huge pressure on the Home Office budget. To bring down these costs as soon as possible, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has already laid legislation to remove the retrospective element of the Illegal Migration Act which will significantly reduce the use of hotel accommodation. These measures will save nearly £800 million this year and avoid costs spiralling even further next year. This was a bad use of taxpayers' money and we will not do it. Mr Speaker, the previous government claimed it was levelling up the country. It made promise after promise to the British people. But the spending audit has uncovered that some of those commitments weren't worth the paper that they were written on. At autumn statement last year, the former Chancellor announced £150 million for an investment opportunity fund. Not a single project has been supported from that fund. So following discussions with my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, I'm cancelling it today. Because if we cannot afford it, we cannot do it. The previous government also made a series of commitments on transport. Promises that people expected to be delivered promises that many members across this House campaigned on in good faith. But the party opposite has failed them. We have seen from the National Audit Office the chaos that the previous government presided over. Projects over budget and delayed again and again. The spending audit has revealed £1 billion of unfunded transport projects that have been committed to next year. So my right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, will undertake a thorough review of these commitments. As part of that work, She has agreed not to move forwards with projects that the previous government refused to publicly cancel, despite knowing full well that they were unaffordable. That includes proposed work on the A303 and the A27. And my right honourable friend will also cancel the Restoring Our Railway programme, saving uh, £85 million next year, with individual projects to be assessed through her review. If we cannot afford it, we cannot do it. Mr Speaker, the previous government had plans. The previous government had plans for a retail sale of Natwest shares. 
We intend to fully exit our shareholding in NatWest by 2025-26. But having considered advice, I have concluded that a retail share sale offer would involve significant discounts that could cost taxpayers hundreds of millions of pounds. It would therefore not represent value for money and it will not go ahead. It is a bad use of taxpayers' money and we will not do it. Next, let me address the unfunded pressures in our NHS and our social care sector. In October 2020, the government announced that 40 new hospitals would be built by 2030. Since then, only one new project has opened to patients, and only six have started their main construction activity. The National Audit Office were clear that delivery was wildly off track. But since coming into office, it has become clear that the previous government continued to maintain its commitment to 40 hospitals without anywhere close to the funding required to deliver them. That gave our constituents false hope. We need to be straight with the British people about what is deliverable and what is affordable. So we will conduct a complete review of the new hospital programme with a thorough, realistic and costed timetable for delivery. Mr Speaker, Adult social care was also neglected by the previous government. The sector needs reform to improve care and to support staff. In the previous parliament, the government made costly commitments to introduce adult social care reform charges, but they delayed them two years ago because they knew that local authorities were not ready and that their promises were not funded. So it will not be possible to take forward those charging reforms. This will save over £1 billion by the end of next year. Mr Speaker. I want this side to be quiet as well. I want to hear the chance of the exchequer. I can understand why people and members are angry. I am angry too. The previous government let people down. Mr Speaker, the previous government made commitment after commitment without knowing where the money was going to come from. They did this repeatedly, knowingly and deliberately. Today I am calling out the Conservatives' cover-up and I am taking the first steps to clean up what they have left behind. But the scale of the inheritance we have been left means the decisions we have so far announced will not be enough. This level of overspend is not sustainable. Left unchecked, it is a risk to economic stability. And unlike the party opposite, I will never take risks with our country's economic stability. So it therefore falls to us to take the difficult decisions now to make further in-year savings. Mr Speaker, the scale of the situation we are dealing with means incredibly tough choices. I repeat today the commitment that we made in our manifesto to protect the triple lock. But today I am making the difficult decision that those not in receipt of pension credit or certain other means-tested benefits will no longer receive the winter fuel payment from this year onwards. The government will continue to provide winter fuel payments worth £200 to households receiving pension credit or £300 to households in receipt of pension credit with someone over the age of 80. Let me be clear, this is not a decision I wanted to make, nor is it the one that I expected to make, but these are the necessary and urgent decisions that I must make. It is the responsible thing to do, to fix the foundations of our economy and bring back economic stability. Alongside this change, I will work with my right honourable friend, the Work and Pension Secretary, to maximise the take-up of pension credit by bringing forward the administration of housing benefit and pension credit, repeatedly pushed back by the previous government, and by working with older people's charities and local authorities to raise awareness of pension credit and help identify households not claiming it. Mr Speaker, this is the beginning of a process, not the end. I'm announcing today... I'm announcing today that I will hold a budget on October the 30th, alongside a full economic and fiscal forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility. I have to tell the House that the budget will involve taking difficult decisions to meet our fiscal rules across spending, welfare and tax. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, they still don't get it today. Parties in Downing Street, crushing the economy, gambling on the election, party before country every single time. Mr Speaker, it will be a budget to fix the foundations of our economy, 
and it will be a budget built on the principles that this new government was elected on. First, we will treat taxpayers' money with respect by ensuring that every pound is well spent. And we will interrogate every line of public spending to ensure it represents value for money. Second, I can repeat from the dispatch box our manifesto commitment that we will not increase taxes on working people. That means we will not increase national insurance, the basic higher or additional rates of income tax, or VAT. And today, my honourable friend, the Exchequer Secretary, is publishing further detail on our manifesto commitments to close tax loopholes and clamp down on tax avoidance to ensure we bring in that money as quickly as possible. My third principle is that we will meet our fiscal rules. We will move the current budget into balance and we will get debt falling as a share of our economy by the end of the forecast. These are the principles that will guide me at the budget. But let me be honest, challenging trade-offs will still remain. So today I am launching a multi-year spending review. This review will set departmental budgets for at least three years providing the long-term certainty that has been lacking for too long. Okay. As part of that process, final budgets for this year and budgets for next year, 2025-26, will be set alongside the budget on the 30th of October. I will look closely at our welfare system, because if you can work, you should work. That is a principle of this government. Yet under the previous government, welfare spending ballooned, while inactivity has risen sharply in recent years. Yeah. Yeah. So we will ensure that the welfare system is focused on peop supporting people into employment. And we will as assess the unacceptable levels of fraud and error in our welfare system and take forward action to bring that down. Mr Speaker, to fix the foundations of our economy, we must ensure that never again can a government keep from the public the true state of our public finances. The fiscal framework which I have inherited had several flaws. It allowed the government to run down the clock on departmental budgets to avoid difficult decisions and push them back beyond the election. So I am announcing the most significant set of changes to our framework since the inception of the Office of Budget Responsibility. These changes will come into effect in the autumn. First, we have introduced legislation to ensure we can never again see a repeat of the mini budget. Second, we will require the Treasury to share with the Office of Budget Responsibility its assessment of immediate public spending pressures and enshrine that rule in the Charter for Budget Responsibility so that no government can ever again cover up the true state of our public finances. Yeah. And finally, we will ensure that never again do public service budgets get set at only a few months' notice. Instead, Spending reviews will take place every two years with a minimum planning horizon of three years to avoid uncertainty for departments and to bring stability to our public finances. Yeah, I've already spoken to the Chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility to brief him on the findings of our audit and our reforms. Mr Speaker, by launching the spending review, I'm also today starting the firing gun on a new approach to public service reform to drive greater productivity in the public sector. So no. We will embed an approach to government that is mission-led, that is reform-driven, with the greatest focus on prevention and integration of services at both a national and local level, and that is enabled by new technology, including through the work of my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, on the opportunities of AI to improve our public services. We will establish a new Office of Value for Money, with an immediate focus on identifying areas where we can reduce, stop, or improve the value of spending. And we will appoint a COVID corruption commissioner to bring back money, to bring back money that is owed to taxpayers after contracts worth billions of pounds were handed out to the previous government during the pandemic. Ahead of the spending review, I will also review the cost of our political system, including restricting eligibility for ministerial severance payments based on time in office. I expect I expect all levels of government to be run effectively and efficiently, and I will work with leaders across our country to deliver just that. That means effective local government, a civil service delivering good value for the British taxpayer, and reform of our political institutions, including the House of Lords, to keep costs as low as possible. Mr Speaker, the Budget and Spending Review will also set out further progress on our number one mission, to grow our economy. 
because economic growth is the only way to sustainably improve our public services and sustainably improve our public finances. So we will use the spending review to prioritise specific areas of capital investment that leverage in billions more in private investment. It won't happen overnight, it will take time and it will take focus, but we have already made significant progress. Planning reforms to get Britain building, a national wealth fund to catalyse private investment, a pensions investment review to unlock capital for our businesses, Skills England to create shared national ambition to boost skills across our country and work across government on a new industrial strategy driven forward by a growth mission board to ensure we deliver on our commitments. Our country has fundamental strengths on which we can build and I look forward to welcoming business leaders to the International Investment Summit in Britain later this year. Because I know that if we can create the stable conditions which investors need to thrive, we will return confidence to our economy so that entrepreneurs and businesses, big and small, know that this is the best place in the world to start and grow a business. Because that is the bedrock on which economic growth must be built. Mr Speaker, the inheritance from the previous government is unforgivable. After the chaos of Partygate, when they knew trust in politics was at an all-time low, they gave false hope to Britain. Yeah. When people were already being hurt by their cost of living crisis, they promised solutions that they knew could never be paid for. Roads that would never be built, public transport that would never arrive, hospitals that would never treat a single patient. They spent like there was no tomorrow because they knew that someone else would pick up the bill. And then in the election, and perhaps this is the most shocking part, they campaigned on a platform to do it all over again. More unfunded tax cuts, more spending pledges, but all the time knowing they had no ability to pay for them. No regard for the taxpayer, no respect for ordinary hardworking people. I will never do that. I will restore our country's economic stability. I will make the tough choices. I will fix the foundations of our economy so we can rebuild Britain and make every part of our country better off. I commend this statement to the House. I now call the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Chancellor for advanced sight of her statement, and I echo her thoughts for the people and emergency services of Southport. Today, she will fool absolutely no one with a shameless attempt to lay the grounds for tax rises she didn't have the courage to tell us about. Order, order, order. Thank you. No, then. This is the covenant. I want it quite like a covenant, like a rubble that's trying to show the judge. She says, Mr. Speaker, the information is new. But she herself told the Financial Times, yeah. you don't need to win an election to find out the state of public finances as we've got the OBR now. Yeah. And Paul Johnson of the IFS says the state of public finances were apparent pre-election to anyone who cared to look, which is why he and other independent figures say her argument is not credible and won't wash. Yeah. Those yeah. public finances were audited by the OBR just 10 weeks before the election was called. We're now expected to believe that in that short period, a £20 billion black hole has magically emerged. But every single day in that period, in fact, since January, in line with constitutional convention, she has had privileged access to the Treasury Permanent Secretary. She could find out absolutely anything she needed. So will she confirm today to the House she did have meetings with the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury before the election? Will she tell the House if they discussed public finances? Will she tell the House if they discussed any of the pressures she's talking about today? And if so, why are we only hearing today what she wants to do about them? That's why today's exercise is not economic, it's political. She wants to blame the last Conservative government for tax rises and project cancellations she's been planning all along. Yeah. The trouble is, even her own published numbers 
expose the fiction behind today's announcement. Just four days ago, she presented to the House the government's estimates of spending plans for the year. Those estimates are a legal requirement, and the official guidance manual is clear. Departments are responsible for ensuring that estimates are consistent with their best forecast of requirements. They're signed off by the most senior civil servants, the accounting officers in every department. Yet four days on, the Chancellor is saying those estimates are wrong. So who's right, politically neutral civil servants or a political Chancellor? If she's right, Will she ask the Cabinet Secretary to investigate those civil servants? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And will she apologise to the House for laying misleading estimates? Yeah. Of course not, because she knows those civil servants are right, and today's black hole is spurious. Yeah. Just like when she says she inherited the worst set of economic circumstances since the Second World War. <laughs> when BBC Verify asked a professor at the London School of Economics about that claim, he responded, I struggle to find a metric that would make that statement correct. Because, Mr Speaker, the metrics speak for themselves. Inflation is 2% today, nearly half what it was in 2010 when we had to clear up the mess inherited from a Labour government. Unemployment is nearly half what it was then with more new jobs than nearly anywhere else in Europe. And so far this year, we're the fastest growing G7 economy. And over the next six years, the IMF say we will grow faster than France, Italy, Germany, or Japan. Indeed, just two days before the election was called, the managing director of the IMF praised the previous government's handling of the economy and said it was in a good place. This week, the Institute for Fiscal Studies said it was not a bad situation to take charge of and certainly not comparable to the 1940s or 1970s. Mr. Speaker, if you're in charge of the economy, it's time to stop trash talking it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the point of going to New York or Brazil to bang the drum for more investment if you come home with a cock and bull story about how bad everything yeah. is? She should stop playing politics with Britain's reputation and get on with running the economy. Yeah. So when, it comes, so when it comes to public finances, will she confirm to the House that far from being broke and broken, as Downing Street briefed the media, the forecast deficit today is 4.4% compared to 10.3% when Labour left office in 2010. In other words, when Labour was last in office, we were borrowing double current levels. And will she confirm another difference between today and 2010? The Conservatives came to office then being honest about our plans and saying very straightforwardly we needed to cut the deficit, whereas she's just won an election telling us repeatedly taxes will not go up. Yeah. How many seats were won on the back of commitments not to raise tax while she's quietly planning to do the exact opposite? Yeah. Yeah. So turning to the details she's announced today, will she confirm that around half today's fictitious black hole comes from discretionary public sector pay awards. In other words, not something she has to do, but something where she has a choice. Will, will she confirm to the House that apart from the teacher's recommendation, none of the other pay review body recommendations were seen by the last government as they arrived after the election was called? Now today, she has chosen to accept those recommendations. But before doing so, was she advised by officials to ask unions for productivity enhancements before accepting above inflation pay awards to help pay for those awards as the last government did? And if she was advised to do that, why did she reject that advice and simply tell the unions, here's your money, thanks for your support? Will she confirm? Will she, I know they don't like the truth, but here it is. Will she confirm that one of the reasons for her funding gap is that she's chosen to backdate a 22% pay award to junior doctors to cover the time when they were striking? We are just, Mr. Speaker, we are just three months into the financial year. So why did she not mention today that at the start of the year, the Treasury had a reserve of £14 billion unexpected revenue costs and £4 billion for unexpected capital costs. Additionally, why has she not accounted 
for the Treasury's ability to manage down in-year pressures on the reserve, last year alone by £9 billion. Why has she apparently not accounted for underspends, typically £12 billion a year? Has she totally abandoned the £12 billion of welfare savings planned by the last government? And if so, will she confirm that to the House? Has she also abandoned £20 billion of annual productivity savings planned by the last government? And if so, and if so, if not, why aren't they in her numbers? And finally, for someone who claims continuously the mantle of fiscal rectitude, will she confirm that in order to pay for her public spending plans, she will not change her fiscal rules to target a different debt measure so she can increase borrowing and debt by the back door? Calvis. Every Chancellor faces pressures on public finances. After a pandemic and energy crisis, those pressures are particularly challenging, which is why in the autumn of 22, the previous government took painful but necessary decisions on tax and spend. But we knew going forward that if we continued to take difficult decisions on pay, productivity, and welfare reform, we could live within our means and start to bring taxes down. She, on the other hand, knew perfectly well a Labour government would duck those difficult decisions. She's caved into the unions on pay, left welfare reform out of the King's speech, soft pedalled on our productivity programme, and that is a choice, not a necessity. And that choice, that choice means that taxes will have to go up, and she chose not to tell us before the election. Instead, in 24 days, just 24 days, she's announced £7.3 billion for GB Energy, £8.3 billion for the National Wealth Fund, and around £10 billion for public sector pay awards. That's £24 billion in 24 days. Around a billion pounds for every day she's been in office, leaving taxpayers to pick up the tab for her profligacy. And doing it this way, she makes the first major misstep of her time as Chancellor, because that great office of state depends more than any on trust. Yeah. Yeah, in, her, in, in, her first, yes, in her first big moment, she breaks that trust with an utterly bogus attempt to hoodwink the public about the choices she has. Over 50 times in the election, they told us they had no plans to raise taxes. Now, in a U-turn that will forever shame this Labour government, she is laying the ground to break her word. And when she does, her first budget will become the biggest betrayal in history by a new Chancellor. And working families will never forgive her. Yeah.